I was asked recently, what do you do, you know, when you're sharing the gospel, you know, preaching as it were, to someone and they tell you that they don't want to hear it? And I, I think my answer probably offended someone. I said, you shut up. <laughs> I mean, quite frankly, doesn't that make sense? If someone doesn't want to hear what you have to say, do you keep telling them anyways? I mean, that's not too bright, is it? You see, it wasn't like Jesus went to each person and said, and grabbed them by the shoulders and said, Look, listen to me. you got to get saved. you got to get saved. You're dying. No. He said, Look, if any man, if, he always used his prepositional phrases to give the opportunity of choice to a person. Now, the first thing you have to learn about, quite frankly, the gospel is that it's a choice. It's not mandatory. If a person really wants to go to hell, they're going to go to hell. That's just their choice. You let them go to hell. No offense, but quite frankly, there's a lot of people that are going to go to hell. Simply because either they don't believe it or they do believe it and they refuse to accept it. Because that's what the Bible says. At least in Romans, it says, no, they don't want to do it God's way. They don't want that kind of God. They don't want God, period. They want to be in charge. And God won't have any other gods before him. He said, I am God, period. And so he doesn't mess around when it comes to who's in charge. So to put it bluntly, when it comes to the gospel, you don't go witnessing to someone that doesn't want to hear it. Quite frankly, you're just going to beat yourself up and get bruised and kind of uh, <laughs> hardened of heart because you're no longer going to care whether that person actually gets saved. You see, there's this mistaken idea somehow that all these great evangelism outreaches, you know, you've seen them, where millions of people, you know, like just recently there was a, a great outreach across the country, you know, they connected all the churches and connected all the, all the, you know, venues so that everybody could watch one man and a bunch of musicians, you know, give the gospel message. And then millions of people came to the Lord. Or let's just say the truth. Millions of people made a profession of faith. But if you've been involved in any kind of ministry, you know as well as I do, how many people stick with it? I mean, if you have checked the latest surveys, some of these people that go to some of these revivals, how many times have they gone to a revival and gone forward to rededicate their life or to dedicate their life over and over and over again? There's some people that have said 30 times, well, I don't know about you, but I think either God's not listening or that person's you know really messed up <laughs> because either they are saved and they need to follow up on it or Let's be real. Do they want to be saved or do they want salvation? You see, the salvation that is being promoted right now may not be what most people understand it to be. It's not simply a question of, oh, well, I make a choice today and bingo, I'm in heaven tomorrow. Not really. You see, though God will forgive you, the determination of where you wind up is still a realization of the process of salvation that's worked out in you by way of Jesus doing something in you to accomplish his purposes for you so that he could say to you, well done, a good and faithful servant, so that he'd accept you into the kingdom of heaven. So it's not a legalist thing. There isn't anything you can add to your salvation. But you see, there isn't anything that you can take away from the requirements that God made upon you you may be token, you know, smoking something funny and saying, hey, you know, I got saved because I went forward, I made an altar call, but then you know what? There wasn't a thing in my life to change, except for I started going to church on Sunday and after that, you know, I'd get drink, drunk on Monday, you know. Well, that's part of the problem, you see. You're not saved. And that's why sometimes this whole idea of saved and salvation and people want to get saved, but they aren't saved. You see, they want to get something for nothing. They want to make it one action that takes care of all of their life for the rest of their life so that they can 
I just want to put that in my you know bank account so I can count on it when I'm done partying. You know, when I'm done screwing around, when I'm done doing my own thing. Jesus didn't leave it at that. That's kind of what's messed up about part of the salvation message is that you get this when you start going to church and that's why they usually give you these salvation messages that are kind of kind of interesting. You know, you go forward, you know, you make the profession, they give you a Bible, they give you these follow-up Bible studies, you know, and they tell you get involved in a church and they try to invite you to come and learn because if you don't learn, there is something that Jesus warned about. He said that, look, you know, your your life is kind of like a house, you know, you, you, you've you got this house in it, you know, and you have this unexpected guest. This person moved in on you and you didn't know it, you know, and they're living in your house, you know, and they're messing it up, you know, and it's kind of like your house is a mess. Well, I'll, I'll come in and straighten out your house and I'll take care of it for you, you know, where you're living, but you got to, you know, like let me do the work and you got to kind of like give me the authority. So the person says, okay, Jesus, here's the keys, you know, I'll, I'll give you my house, you know, and you can take care of it, you know, the body you're living in, so to speak, or your life. And so Jesus says, okay, well, great. He goes, tries the door, and you've locked the door. You know, you, you padlocked it. You said, I changed my mind, you know. Well, I won't tell God that, but I'm just going to change my mind by, you know, partying with my house guests, because after all, you know, I don't want to give up my friends. I don't want to give up my partying. I don't want to give up anything. I just wanted to be saved. And so... When you, quite frankly, Jesus figures out a way to crawl in the window and, you know, starts cleaning up your house, you know, and he does, you know, you suddenly go, um, you know, I don't think I like this so much. So then, one of your buddies comes knocking on the window, doesn't he? Or he comes knocking on the door, and you open up the door, and he brings seven more of his buddies with him. And so they come in, and they trash the place. And your life is worse of a mess than it ever was in the beginning. So you see, there's a parable there that Jesus told about that was talking about a house and demons but it works for the same way about you being involved with your friends in the world because you don't know where your friends have been <laughs> let me be honest with you <laughs> you don't know what they've been doing and you know what quite frankly judging by the amount of sexual problems that are going on in the world with sexual sin and all that you really don't know where they've been have you <laughs> and what they've been doing so a lot of what the realization of salvation is, isn't just this idea of, oh, well, great, you know, I'm just going to, like, kick it, you know, and I'm going to make kind of like a token, you know, spoken word, you know, and then I'm just going to, you know, do my own thing, you know, and then it's just like my bud, Jesus, you know, I mean, he's he's like kind of my buddy, you know, he's going to make my life, you know, happy, and I'm just going to take a knee every now and then, you know, Tebow it. No, you see, eventually... Somebody's going to tell you the truth. And the reality comes in when you go to a church and you listen to some messages or somebody starts to teach you or you read the Bible and just read the words that Jesus said and read. Quite frankly, he said, look, not everyone, though I call everyone, not everyone is chosen. Many are called, but few are chosen. So it's not a question of this whole idea where, you know, oh, once saved, always saved, you know, and you... You, you grabbed a hold of that part, but you didn't listen to what the salvation part is. But you grabbed a hold of the, you know, like, grace is, by grace am I saved. I don't have to do any works, you know, because it's a works of righteousness. Oh, brother, you can't judge me because after all, you know, you can't judge. No, judge not, you know, blah, blah, blah. No, you know, it's not really that. It's kind of like, you know, look at the fruit of your life. It doesn't matter what anybody around you says. It doesn't matter what anybody tells you your life looks like. What really matters is whether you're stinking thinking or not. Because you see, everyone can look on the outside and see your house is a mess. Fine, maybe you're a messy housekeeper. Every can, everybody could can look on the outside and see you're not living in a house. Oh, wow, you're a street person? Oh, you must not be a saved saint. Or everybody could look on the outside and say, Oh, well, you know, you haven't had a bath in six days. And yet, God doesn't look at those things at all. He doesn't care where you're living, and he doesn't care only about what you're doing. He cares what's happening on the inside. You see, the person who may look like a mess on the outside may have God working on the inside that's causing him to vomit out all this stuff that's on the inside. So he really looks like a mess because God is cleaning up what's on the inside of his heart. God is dealing with the issues that a person may have from all the baggage and and hatreds and biases and prejudices of this world 
And that person may be struggling with it every day of their life until the very day they die. And yet God will free them from that in death. So no man knows who is saved and who isn't saved because man looks on the outward things, but God looks on the heart. But the point is, you know. You yourself, the person who's making that choice, are very well aware whether or not you have actually asked Jesus to take over your life. You yourself know whether you have asked God to be in control of your life. You yourself know that Proverbs 3, 5, and 6 tells you to trust Him and not your own understanding. So at some point in time, you know whether or not you're saved. And that's the only thing that matters. Because God is going to screw up your life in order to rearrange you and change you into the person He wants you to be. Because you may have your house blown down because you've done some stupid things with the decisions you've made. You may find yourself in the midst of you know, conflict and chaos because you got saved, because you're at conflict with the world and its ways. But you'll find yourself in the midst of God's presence if you simply ask Him and cry out to the Lord your God to be saved. Because they that cry out to the Lord shall be saved, God said. It doesn't say He leaves them the way they are. It says that He'll work with them and deliver them from their problems that are current and help them to develop a process of salvation where they will stand before God holy and acceptable in His sight. So you see, it's not about works of righteousness, which we have done, but according to His mercy He saved me. So when you cry out to God, it's not really kind of like, hey, you know, going with the buds, you know, and making this like, you know, we're going to do a massive confession, you know, and we're all going to get saved. But rather, it's what happens when you're alone, one-on-one, -on -one, with the living God? What happens when no one else is around in the midst of the dark? And there's Jesus standing before you, even in his word as you read it. What happens when you read something and God makes it so obvious that he wants you to do it that you can't stand looking at it, that you have to slam the Bible shut and put it away? What do you do in those moments? That's the point of whether you're saved. Because you see, none of us are perfect. No one ever is. There is none righteous, no, not one. Not even after salvation is anyone perfect. And there will be people that will contradict even the very words they say by failing miserably in their life in some way, shape, or form. Because God will have no other gods, and anything that exalts itself shall be abased. But everything that abases itself shall be exalted. So the world has it always backwards. And so when you see people like, say, a Tim Tebow or some great hero of faith in some way, you know, like the Vukcevics or whatever may be, the Johnny Ericsons, those aren't really the ones you want to look at, you know, to be your heroic people of faith. You want to look at the everyday struggler, you know, not the person who's accomplished something because you didn't see them all along the way. You want to see the person who's right next to you who's just like you, struggling to make ends meet, trying to figure out this thing called faith, trying to discover and uncover what a relationship with Jesus really is like. And that's why Vidivo always stresses that it's not about the many, but it's about the one. And if you understand that it's about the one, then you know it's about you. Where are you at? What are you doing today? What makes you so confident and competent that you don't fear at times for your salvation? Because you see, every man comes to a place where, yes, at some point in time, no matter who you are, whether Billy Graham's or anyone, there comes a point of fear where you realize that God is holy and we are not. And John himself, when he went to heaven, cried out as a man undone. For he said, I am a wicked man and a man of unclean lips. And so the angel came and took the coal and cleansed him. All of us, all we are like sheep that have gone astray, and everyone gone to his own way. But the Lord has laid on Jesus the sins of us all. So at some point in time, your salvation experience comes to the realization that you can't do it. And that, yes, Christianity is a crutch. And yes, there are things you have to do. And those things are going to make you into the person God wants you to be. Because as much as you don't like it, you do need to go to church somewhere, somehow, and find something that's going to instruct you.
Because if you don't know you're saved, you need to figure that one out real fast.